Hello there, everybody. Back by popular demand. Sorry, two seconds. Unpopular demand. It is me, Adam Cleary. We've got some Star Trek content. Ooh. Right, first off, before I start, I just want to address the little elephant in the room here. The state of me. There are storms in the UK, and I just went out for lunch in the middle of one. So, nice bit of serendipity for you here. I am someone who regrets leaving the office. About to tell you about people who regret leaving Star Trek. You're sitting there thinking, mm, people who regret leaving Star Trek. Well, I'm a huge Star Trek fan, and in all the many series across all the many decades with the hundreds of actors, I can't really think of too many people who come to mind, and that is bang on correct. So few people regret leaving Star Trek because so few people ever actually really do leave Star Trek. Like, just think about it for a minute. Yes, you're contracted for anywhere between four and seven seasons, depending on which show you were on, but also, after that, the show never really ends, does it? There is a global, a never-ending convention circuit. You are always part of that family. It is never far from the faith in your heart. So you can make a go of this for the entire rest of your life. There is no reason to ever leave but some do. So my name is Adam Cleary, I told you that at the start, and these are five actors who regret leaving Star Trek, which I also told you at the start. Number five, Will Wheaton. Will, Will Wheaton, Will, Will Wheaton, Will Wheaton. Now it's a common misconception about Will Wheaton that he left Star Trek in 1990 because people hated Wesley Crusher. Yes, he was supposed to be slightly annoying in the first series and he got a lot of screen time in the second series and it went on and on and on. He got a lot of abuse. People did not like this annoying child being on the bridge. They found his character quite grating. So naturally, when he left the show after a few seasons, people thought, well, that's why we bullied him off. Nor is it true that he was written out specifically to appease fans like this. The other side of the theory is that, yes, he was just basically kicked off because people hated him and they wanted to make everybody happy, but that's, that's not even true at all. He left of his own volition and it had nothing to do with the fans. It is quite limiting, you see, to play a boy genius on a sci-fi show, especially when you have Will Wheaton's, like, boyish good looks and his young mannerisms. It's the kind of thing that can get you typecast for the entire rest of your career. So we thought, you know what, if I stay here too long, that is going to be me in every single project until the rest of the time. We need to go out there, we need to demonstrate more range, and you get more experience, and that's what he tried to do. Now, I know, I know you're sitting there, you're already thinking about this, you're going, I can't really think of all those other Will Wheaton roles where he played this gruff, burly, bearded action hero, or where he played the evil, sinister, bad guy in a film, because you didn't get them. It never actually, never actually happened for him. In fact, since he's probably most famous for hosting other Star Trek things, doing his Dungeons & Dragons stuff, playing himself on, my God, the worst show in the world, The Big Bang Theory, so it's probably fair to say, his worst fears came true. Although, you know, worst fears in the sense of he's had a very good life. And of course, he did pop back in every now and then, so it wasn't like he cut himself off from his Star Trek family entirely. And apparently, I don't know when this is going out, but he is eyeing up a cameo on Picard, which would, it would get this noise out of me. Hey! Number four, Lysia Naff. All right, so Sonia Gomez, you know her, she spilled all the coffee on the captain. She was actually written into Star Trek The Next Generation to be a recurring character rather than this random one-off. She was seen as a love interest for Geordie LaForge. They were going to fall in love over the course of the season. Then at the end, he was going to risk getting potentially life-threatening surgery to restore his vision so he could see his beautiful, beloved lady friend as she was meant to to be seen. That was a story, but it just never happened. The reason it never happened was because they gave her a stupid, funny introduction, and then they couldn't help themselves from giving her other stupid, funny, comic relief bits of the show, which was not what she was promised when she signed up for it, and realizing it wasn't going the way she wanted, and all of a sudden the writers realizing they weren't using her the way they intended and would not be able to salvage it round to make this love interest angle, they let her go, to which she herself said she was, and I'm quoting, super bummed. Probably shouldn't, no, I've emphasized the wrong part of that, haven't I? Super bummed. Super bummed. And what did she do since? Well, she does have one fairly major movie on her CV with a fairly unforgettable role, but I have to hold my hands up here. I'd never made the connection it was the same person until very recently. She's in, she's in Total Recall, where she plays, anybody, anybody? The three-breasted prostitute. She's on the old IMDB here, and she's also in the film Chopper Chicks in Zombie Town, which came out the same year as she was on Star Trek The Next Generation. And I'll tell you this for free, I will be watching that movie uh, tonight. But I tell you what, all is well, that ends, all's, all's well, all is indeed, why have, I, why have I forgotten I say that? All's well that ends well, something like that. She was back in Lower Decks, wasn't she? She was a captain. Now, she had quite a nice career after spilling all the coffee and going and having all, all the breasts, so well done to her. Number three, Jason Isaacs. 
full of stories and subplots that Star Trek Discovery has done since season one. Just getting Lorca back in some capacity has not been one of them, and I hate that. Honestly, now, friends, I think Lorca was one of the best captains they've ever actually had on Star Trek, because he had that, like, upstanding machismo vibe that Kirk had, very much a throwback to that sort of generation of Starfleet. But also, he had this weird all is not well vibe, because all was not well. He was from the Mirror Universe. He was very, very evil, and he played that absolutely perfectly. He's a highlight of the entire show ever. And of course, in the 13th episode of the very first season, he was booted into a warp reactor and summarily vaporized. But of course, there's all these theories kicking around that was the bad Lorca, so the good Lorca might be somewhere you could possibly get him back, etc, etc, etc. But they never have. Now the thing is, yes, he knew, he did know when he signed up for the show that that was going to be the fate of the character. He was going to be killed off in the first season. But they do have that get out clause of his alternate reality counterpart. And I think he expected for them to use that at some point. He has expressed regret at no longer being on the show when he's done the convention circuit. He said when he watched the show since that he adores all the actors, but it feels very strange to him to watch that show and miss all of his friends. He would love to, and I'm quoting again here, squeeze back into that eight-year-old uniform. Bit weird to do the part once more, but you'd have to do it on what? Strange New Worlds now? Unless he's also magically somehow 900 years in the future? Could work. Number two, Terry Farrell. Now, the story about why Jadzia Dax was written out of Star Trek Deep Space Nine is long, and it is complicated, and it is conflicting, and it's a complete mess, and there's every chance that me attempting to explain it to you now could somehow make it worse. So there are basically two versions of events, but the one that cuts kind of right down the middle of it all is that she requested a lower episode count for the final few seasons when she was renewing a contract so she could explore other avenues, including appearing on that Ted Danson show, Becca, I think the name of it, something like that. Anyway, she requested that and she was told, nope, you're either in full time or you're out. She thought they were bluffing and then she was out. So they killed her off. Now there's been a lot of other stuff thrown around in the midst of all this that she was difficult to work with, or there was misogyny behind the scenes, etc, etc, etc. It's never been properly pinned down. It's never been properly ironed out. But whatever reason, she was out of the show and fans, like nine, 10 year old me included, were devastated. And the thing is, ever since then, every time she's been asked about it, every time she's been on the convention circuit, she expresses her regret at that situation. She left a role that she loved, that she adored to be a part of, to go and explore other things, but it led to roles that she was far less comfortable with. She was great. She was great on that Ted Danson show. I haven't seen her. I just presume she was really, really good. But it wasn't as satisfying for her to do. But then on the flip side, while she does express regret at leaving the show, she also does express pride at the fact she stood up to herself. She thought there was an element of trying to be strong-armed into re-signing a contract she didn't want to sign, and she stood her ground. She said she wouldn't do that, and she lives with the consequences, even if she doesn't really like them. Number one, Eddie Murphy. Uh, all right, Eddie Murphy never technically left Star Trek. I appreciate this does feel like a little bit of a stretch, but let me ask you this. Have you tried putting together a full and comprehensive and concise and entertaining list based on all the actors who regret leaving Star Trek? Oh, no, you haven't. Well, shut up then. He was in to a sufficient extent that they started doing things behind the scenes, preparing for him to be there, and then he was out, so we are just going with it. This is free content, Sh just sit down. So you've all seen Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. It is a terrific 1980s fish out of water movie. Yeah, yeah, they're mammals, etc., etc. It also just happens to be a Star Trek movie. But the thing about it is it was supposed to be a lot funnier than it actually was. Yes, it is quite funny, but it was supposed to be an out-and-out -out comedy starring the cast of Star Trek in San Francisco. Leonard Nimoy, You've probably heard of him. He was summoned to Paramount's lot where he was told that Eddie Murphy was a huge Star Trek fan and would kill to get a part in the new movie. They wanted to make it funny. He was one of the most bankable comedy actors working at the time. It was a match made in heaven. It was definitely, definitely gonna happen. Until it didn't. So Nimoy had a couple of meetings with Eddie Murphy. He pitched them this idea they had where he was going to play this hilarious astrophysicist character who was going to help with Kirk, Spock and McCoy getting the whale and getting back to their present time. Or, as Eddie Murphy literally described this role later, some jive dude with Spock. He wanted to play against type in this. He didn't want to be the comic relief. He didn't want to be the funny guy. He actually wanted to play a Vulcan to try and show that he had serious acting chops. And when that wasn't going to happen, he passed on the role entirely and they started to morph this into Dr. I'm going to say Gillian McKeith there. She's the one off the telly, isn't she? You know, the doctor in, in The Voyage Home who ends up with, you know, Kirk. Gillian Taylor. I knew it was, I knew it was Gillian something. 
Too many Jillians. Now instead, Eddie Murphy did a comedy called The Golden Child, which he himself referred to as a complete piece of shit. And it was released exactly at the same time as The Voyage Home. The Voyage Home was a much bigger commercial success, and Murphy has expressed several times since that in his heart of heart, if he was gonna have to play a comedy character anyway, he should have gone and done the role on Star Trek instead. Oh well! Now you have it, five actors who, as best as we could possibly research, regret leaving Star Trek. Where can you get me if you want to do such a thing? Why? At Adam Cleary, C-L-E-R-Y on Twitter, if you're so inclined. I think it's the same on Instagram as well. I forget the entire Trek Culture family at your disposal, at Trek Culture, but until next we meet, my friends, I have been, of course, Adam Cleary, and I will see you soon.